Howdy, it's Mr. Pete 222 again, your YouTube shop teacher, and in this video I want to change the bearings in a motor. I was criticized uh, mercilessly in, in one video for not uh, <laughs> replacing bearings, but uh, this is a one and a half horse motor, and well, let's plug it in and see what it sounds like. It's kind of noisy. And notice it doesn't spin very long. Well, you couldn't see that, maybe. I'm not sure how that sound uh, appears in the video, but it's kind of noisy. So, in order to change the bearings, of course, I got to take it apart and determine what kind of bearings, what number of bearing is in there. Since I don't carry bearings in stock, oh, don't get me wrong, I got hundreds of bearings, but they're never the right ones. But this is another motor, but. And I've never seen this on a motor before, and I mentioned this recently in another video, I think. But, you know, this one, this Dayton motor actually tells you what bearings you need, you know, on the uh, one end and on the other end. But usually they're the same, and they are on this one. But what is it, a 6203, which is an extremely common bearing. But on the one I'm going to work on, I have to determine uh, what size bearing is, take it apart to do that, and then order bearings so the thing's going to uh, sit here disassembled for a few days on and tie up my bench. I plan on using this motor in a future video, that's why I'm trying to get it up to speed here. It is a one and a half horsepower, 110 volt, 3450, and it's a Gould uh, Century. Century used to be a real popular brand. And it runs fine, it's a good cleaning up. Uh, and what, the first thing I do before I take the end bells off, and I show this in another video, is, is to mark it like on this end, just with two center punch marks so that I reassemble it the same. And on this end, one, two, three, four. And then I also usually make marks like this. That's just the way I'm used to doing it so that I can put it together exactly the way I took it apart. Okay, let's get it apart. And there's the whole rotor. Maybe you call it the armature. Now I got to get the end bell off of there. That's of course the part of the centrifugal switch or the centrifugal mechanism. Uh, if you if there's any washers here, do not lose them because those are spacer washers, and you must reassemble it the same uh, the same way so you don't have too much end play. And there's the bearing. Now you can see grease in here, so this bearing is not dry, but it's, it spins too freely and there's just a little bit of slop in there, but it, it's open on this end, the way it goes in like that, but I believe it's shielded or sealed on the other side. I, can, I cleaned it and I cannot read the bearing number, so it's on the other side, so I have to pull the bearing off to, to determine what to order. I've told you many times you can never be too thin or too rich nor have enough pullers. And there's a great truism to what I just said. And you know it makes so it so easy when you do have a puller, otherwise you're you know, I was fifty years old before I realized that I was using punches. Well I never had anything. And you, yeah, it is shielded, remember not not sealed it. Not sealed. There's three different kinds of bearings. There's plain open bearings. There's shielded. That's a metal shield. It might be on one side or two sides. And there are bearings that are uh, have rubber seals. Or you might have a seal on one side and a shield. You know, there's just a lot of combinations, but I will order whatever is cheapest and fastest to get. So let me wipe this a little bit and I can read the number. Now, if you're a man my age, you will find that uh, every year they put the numbers and, and letters on these bearings and other parts in a smaller size, in decreasing, <laughs> all right, never mind.
Anyway, it's a 6203. I added the RS on there for rubber seal. It might even be a 2RS, but I'll, I'll just see what they have on on uh, eBay, Feebay, and, and order a couple of them. Now, it'll be a couple days before I have those, but in the meantime, what I will do is clean up everything real well in, in solvent. And the windings here really look nice, excellent condition, but this is... Uh, full of debris because again this is an open type of motor I've talked about that not that that's object objectionable for this application but uh, and but you can see how the dirt gets in there and I haven't even taken the other end bell off yet because you know and I'll probably do that in the second half no I'll do it right now what the heck am I waiting for it's just that it, it will hang there by wires so that's, which which is Oh, I, what I didn't show you here, <clears throat> some motors, and this is one of them, is provided with uh, little spots here where you, right here, where you can get a screwdriver to pry it open so you don't have to, to bang on it. But you can tap on them, it doesn't hurt a thing. So right here, see how nicely that pries off? And then there'll be one on the other sides someplace if I can find it. There we go. Right, that came right apart. And of course, just as I told you, the centrifugal switch is uh, wired right in there so that I, the end bell doesn't come off freely without taking the switch out. But also in here is the overload protector. Not all motors have that, but that will trip out if you overload it. So that's what all of that stuff is but the, the bearings inside there and I guess I probably will have to take this apart to get that bearing out of there there are three screws holding this whole assembly in there and I hope that once I take those out it'll free the end bell but if not I'll some of these wires could be unplugged as well but since that's in the way for accessing the bearing I might as well take it off now and make it easy on myself that's number two. And there's still a couple more wires. Let me see what I got to do here to get this out. But that's the actual switch itself. You know, I'm not going to talk about this, but the centrifugal switch, of course, just connects and disconnects the capacitor. This is a capacitor start motor. You know, there's two sets of windings in here. I talked about that in another video. I guess that's not the purpose of this video to try to explain that. Yeah, that was easy enough. I had two screws to disassemble this overload protector, and there were three screws on the centrifugal switch, and now the end bell is free for me to handle and clean. I'll probably take that ground screw off. I had to disconnect these two leads as well and then determine what I have to do here to get that bearing out of there or is that a that might be a sleeve bearing in there. That's a that's not a ball bearing that's a sleeve bearing. Well, maybe that's not unusual. It is to me that there's a sleeve bearing on one end and a ball bearing on the other. So I really only have one to replace, and I didn't need to take that all apart other than this will facil facilitate uh, cleaning of this. I don't have to worry about getting any of the wiring uh, uh, wet with solvent. All right. So I'm either going to find a bearing and I wrote some notes to myself here too and took some pictures although if I get stuck like what goes where you know I, I can go back and look at the video <laughs> so and I have to do that sometimes I, you know I got a memory even shorter than yours well so I need a bearing and I'm, I just hope that there's not much wear right here because I do not intend to replace that and that is there's no oiler for that either. 
All right. I'll either be back shortly or be back in three days. Well, it's two hours later, not two days later, and I have spent considerable time here, well, two hours actually, cleaning up these end bells, and that, that cleaned up very nicely, inside and out. It'd be nice to do a paint job, but you know how that goes. It took quite a while to clean up this fan, and it still doesn't look very good, but there's, I removed a lot of debris. And again, talking about this end now, this is the centrifugal switch end, and there's a washer there. So that is a sleeve bearing. And there doesn't seem to be any slop there at all. That's still a good fit. There's, there's no wear. And there is an oiler here, which means there's also a wick in there. But it doesn't even look like a bronze bearing, but it's in perfect condition. So I just don't have to worry about that at all. And I can, I'll oil it as I reassemble it, but we also have an oiler right there. We, I. So, usually, I used to call these squirrel cage rotors or armatures. I don't know if that's correct. I've never seen one built this way, so that's a little unusual. So, looking at the other end now, well, let's talk about bearings. Okay, I went down into the basement to my stash, and I have even more than what you see here, but it didn't take very long of rooting through here. Matter of fact, this was on the top. It's a number 203, Napa. Somebody's got some notes on there, whoever bought this, but the, of course this, these all came from an auction at one, over a period of years, not all at once. So it's a collection is what it is. A hoard, if you will. And this is exactly the bearing, and I already checked it with the uh, calipers. It's shielded on one side and open on the other. So I will pack this with a little bit of grease, and I'm going to go ahead and... Wrong, wrong piece. I'll grease it and press it into place. Now, some of you might say this ought to be pressed onto the shaft first, so I don't know. Anyway, that's the way I'm going to do it. And these cleaned up nicely and solvent. So let me press that into place. I'll grease it off camera. It's kind of dark over here, but here's the Dake press. And I'm using a socket, I don't know, craftsman socket of whatever appropriate size here is needed. Ready to go. And now I will proceed to put the end bell onto the shaft, and I've already oiled this lightly, and the inside of the bearing. And I'll just tap it into place. That didn't take much. Next I'm ready to reassemble uh, all of the wiring onto this end bell. This is the one without the uh, uh, without the bearing, the plain bearing. So in there the switch goes and a couple of screws to hold that in place. Alright, the thermal overload is t in place and tightened down. And now the centrifugal switch, and for your information, the centrifugal switch has the actual, let's see, where's the, the actual contacts are right here, where I'm sliding the, the card in between. And I cleaned those up just a little bit with some abrasive cloth. And now this is ready to uh, screw in place. Remember, there's three screws for that.
the centrifugal switch tightened down, three screws. And now this end bell brought into position and I lost my one sharpie mark, but fortunately there I've got the center punch marks. I think that's already pretty good position. And finally, a little bit of oil, which I've already put on the end of the shaft, and I can assemble this. And where's my mark? Right there. And the four draw bolts. And now to tighten up all four bolts evenly, so there's no bind. And it spins freely. All right, let's plug it in and give it a test run. I think I'll polish up the shaft just a little bit. And there it is, ready for another 10 years of service. Thanks for watching. This is Tubal Kane saying so long for now.